welcome to the filmmakers and to all of you who have taken time out of your busy schedule to attend. Please enjoy. I'd like to also thank my staff, um, made up of very talented people. First, first among them is Catherine Douglas, um, Jessica Williams, and Jennifer Ogwamike. Um, and we really appreciate you guys for all the work that you've put into this, this project. A big thank you also goes out to the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences and the DePaul School of Cinematic Arts, and also the co-sponsors, which is the African and Black Diaspora, Diaspora Studies Program and the Department of International Studies. We would also like to thank all the festival jury members. One among them uh, is here tonight, Camille DeBose and Ramon Yule and Raphael Nash. I'd like to do a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded to the center's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. If you'd like to disable your video, uh, please click the stop video in the lower left-hand corner. Please keep your microphones off and we encourage you to watch tonight's program in speaker view by switching your viewing settings in the top right corner. So let's get into the meat of it. I'd like to first introduce, and I'm sorry Ife, if I, I crucify your name here, Ife Yinwa Arinze. Ife is a neuroscientist turned filmmaker from Nigeria and is currently based in New York City. Her work is focused on highlighting black female relationships and intimacy through a myriad of lenses. She has worked as a neuroscience researcher in Massachusetts and Michigan, and she continues to draw her creative inspiration from human behavior. Ife received her BA at Mount Olio College, and she's now an MFA candidate in the graduate film program at NYU Titch School of Arts. And we'll move to Kai Thomas here in Chicago. Kai Thomas is a Liberty City native whose curiosity was born and nurtured in the Moonlight neighborhood. She's a filmmaker, DP interested in stories at the intersection of identity, self-determination and location. Kai is a next doc, Sundance Ignite, Sisters in Cinema, Double Exposure, and Kartempkin Diverse Voices in Documentary Fellow, and was a Berlin Capital Fulbright Awardee in 2017, as well as a Tribeca Film IF, then finalist in 2019. She's an Emmy Awarded winning producer for her two season tenure at CBS Sunday Morning, a graduate of Boston College. She was a Jackie Robinson Foundation Scholar. And finally, we have Brandon Hayes, Haynes. Brandon is a, an award-winning narrative and commercial cinematographer and director based in New York, Brooklyn, New York. He started his creative journey as a photographer in 2009 and fell in love with cinematography after attending Denver Series Fest in 2016. Teaching himself the rules and tricks of the trade, he now blends the worlds of music, fashion, sports with his love for TV and cinema. His drive to continually perfect his craft and capture a striking balance of color and shadow has allowed him to shoot for a diverse array of clients, including Hennessy, Uptown Magazine, Adidas, Essence Magazine, BET, Volkswagen, DoorDash, Facebook. And so we have it, we have an incredible group of filmmakers here present. However, I'd also like to include a bio of our very talented moderator, Camille DeBose here present. Camille DeBose is a lecturer and an award-willing filmmaker in the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul. With a master's degree in sociology and an MFA in cinema, she takes an, an academic approach to the exploration of social forces through the analysis and production of film. Her first film, Good Hair and Other Dubious Distinctions, sparked conversation on intracultural racism and the othering which occurs inside our own community. With a decade of teaching at DePaul, Camille DeBose has taught an assortment of courses on gender, cinema production, sociology, and ethics. There you have it. I would like to now uh, start off the program 
with the first screening. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see all these folks here. Wonderful. All right, let's see if technology works. We're gonna start off with the screening of Efi's film, Holding Space. And so the way the program is going to work, because I feel like <clears throat> I definitely wanted to create a sense of community you know, we could have just given you the links ahead of time and have you come here. And I feel like the purpose is to have this really shared experience. And so what will happen is we'll drop the link to the film in the chat. You will watch it and then you will pop back in. And then we'll have the other fil the filmmaker introduce their film. You will go and watch it and come back in. These are three short films. Um, and they're not very, very long films. And so what will happen is I will go ahead and have Ify go ahead and give us sort of the context of the film holding space, and then we'll drop the link in the chat for folks. Ify? Yes, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. It's such an honor to have this film screened. I definitely did not imagine um, this film being screened. I was just very focused on um, the making of it. And it's a short documentary that I made in December of 2019, as well as in um, January of 2020. Um, I made it as a project for a class as an introduction to documentary, just really learning the skill and art of documentary. Um, and I'm very passionate and interested in showcasing the realities of um, Black women. And so I reached out to a friend um, asking about doulas um, that I could shadow and observe. And I was very aware of you know, the state of um, Black uh, maternal health. And so that was just something I was very interested in. And so I found a doula to follow and I followed her as she um, held sessions for a few Black women. And this film is a product of that. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'm very honored to have you all watching this. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ify. Um, Catherine, if you could drop the link in the chat. Oh, there it goes. All right, and we will see you back here in about five minutes. Hi, right. let us know about you, why you do film, what's the context of this whole story. Hey everyone, I'm so honored to be here this evening and getting a chance to share Douglas, which is a short verite documentary that chronicles the organizing efforts of then fifth graders at Village Leadership Academy, which is a K through eight school in the South Loop um, that has a grassroots curriculum component, which in um, at every grade level, even at kindergarten, they identify an issue in the community and work towards, um, you know, building strategy to change that issue. So for this fifth grade class, they identified um, what was then Stephen Douglas Park in the North Lawndale neighborhood. And this year actually was when the park actually got renamed to be Anna and Frederick Douglass Park, which is really exciting. Um, but this film shows their organizing efforts from 2018. Um, and I'm really happy to share it with you all this evening. All right, we will drop that link in the chat and off you all go. And we'll see you back in four minutes, four and a half, five minutes. Wonderful, I think people are trickling back into the room. Um, and of course, we deliberately saved the film that won the jury prize for last. And that film is uh, by Brandon Haynes, who's here in the room. And so Brandon, uh, I know Camille DeBose have a ton of questions for you that you'll answer, but if you could kind of just set it up and uh, frame uh, why you made this film and, and um, the context for it, actually. Sure. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon. Uh, and so, Legacy essentially it, it was therapy for me. Um, I created this film out of having a need to make something during a, a time that's very traumatic for people of color, Black people in particular. And this was my answer to that. Um, I wanted to share, share it with you and bring more awareness to um, that Black Lives Matters and um, give an honorary thank you to an individual who is at the forefront of helping to get our message out there um, and lead the way. And so Legacy is a, it's a short documentary that is an intimate um, 
expose a piece into life of Mark Lennon, um, who was a photographer who was known for taking the Black Lives Matter 2020 protest photo uh, in front of Trump Towers, which went around to be seen throughout the world and became the face of technically the, the movement of 2020. And yeah, hope you enjoy. All right, so folks, let's We'll usher back out the room for another five minutes and we'll see you back here. It'll be the last time you have to do this. <laughs> see you shortly. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm glad, one of the reasons we did this, we could have given folks the link to watch and then, but we wanted folks to watch it and have it fresh in their minds so that they can really engage with the filmmakers right away. And so I'm going to pivot to my colleague Camille and have her run the show. I know she's got a lot of questions to ask these filmmakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you've enjoyed the films. I know that I have. It's not my first time seeing them. And they, they are just as delightful um, as sort of my first experience with them. So I'm going to start my questions kind of uh, in order of appearance. So in order of the, the way that we were introduced to the films. So I'll start with holding space. Um, so Ife, I like that you've titled yours an observational documentary and your film is a collection of moments, right? And so I'm curious about, can you talk to us how you chose, tell us how you chose those moments um, and what is it that you were working to convey like with respect to that curation? Um, thanks for that perceptive question. I, it was with shooting documentary as I'm sure the other talented, you know, filmmakers here will appreciate is editing documentary is really hard. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work that there's just it's really intense because a lot of times you just I think with documentary especially shooting documentary and it's it's pertinent to other forms of filmmaking and other art forms is just like it's very essential to be present and just ready to capture what happens in front of you when making a documentary film you can go with an idea a concept but honestly you're just there to capture what happens. And so I had an idea of seeing this doula in this space with these women. And as I was just sitting with them, there's just so much that was just pouring forth in those spaces and being shared. So I just had to be fully present for that. But when I went to the editing room, I had to realize that just because something happened doesn't mean it all <laughs> needs to be in the film. And just like being thoughtful about what goes into the film and how it can be cohesive. So I actually followed the doula and saw four different mothers. Um, and so it just ended up just, as, and I think I mentioned earlier, like this was a class project. So actually there was a time restriction on the length of the project. So that was something that was I was also working with, a limitation I was working with. But um, as I was reviewing the footage, I was just looking for things that spoke to each other between, between the women. Um, and something that kept coming Fourth is just, I'm not a mom, but just having space with somebody to just share like the fears and doubts and insecurities. I think that was just something that I felt like could speak to like across the women. And so I was just keeping in mind like what the, the vulnerabilities that these women were sharing with this doula. Um, and yeah, that was so that for me, I was choosing moments where they were just like, being very intimate with the duel and just sharing things with her. And also I was choosing moments where the doula really was holding space for them to share those things and for her to receive them without judgment, but to hear them and then also like support them in that. That's love. I mean, like that's that's pretty fantastic, right? I think that it's it's something that we are becoming much more sensitive to. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that it's it has a lot to do with your particular um, what I like to call the filmmaker's habitus. Like, so, you know, your particular viewpoint, your mm -hmm. education, your academic focus, mm -hmm. your academic experience. So, and this is something that we try to talk to our young filmmakers about as well, right? Like what are, what is the thing that you do and how does that impact the work that you will make? So I have just one more question. So with that in mind, how do you think your, your education and your focus, right? Um, 
how did that impact the creation of this particular product, this particular object, right? I, I, they definitely impacted it. You know, I feel like, you know, who we are definitely impacts like how we see and navigate the world. Um, I know we were talking about this earlier about, you know, me being um, an MFA candidate at NYU, which honestly is a blessing and such a privilege because I have access to classmates that I adore and respect and admire who have like really brilliant insights and also have access to professors with, um, with, yeah, with a lot of valuable critique. Um, and so I think, honestly, just even going back to my upbringing, I grew up in Nigeria, I grew up with a, um, a widowed mom and um, was raised by her and her sisters. And I went to an all girls boarding school, went to an all women's college. And so my life is really heavily shaped by the women that raised me and the women I've just grown up with. And so for me, my just like my calling is just black black women and black female intimacy. So that for sure was like um, a big factor into just choosing this subject, um, just a vested interest in blackness and women, um, and just also in intimacy as well. So I think that definitely shapes just like the eye that I went into this film with, and also I'm a photographer as well. So that definitely shapes me. Um, and then as far as my education, like going into the editing room and going into classrooms and receiving a lot of notes about what could make this film stronger, but also realizing what I could take of that could be of value and what I could also discard as well. And so a professor of mine who's also a Black woman, she was very crucial to the shaping of this film as well. She just gave me a lot of insight because initially I had considered focusing this film on just one of the women. Um, and just letting that be the whole film, the, the, a session that the doula had with one of the women, but she encouraged me to um, include other mothers so that we could see the doula with other women. So Santanish Myers, I just want to say her name because she was helpful in like for me shaping this film. And I had access to that because I am a student at um, the graduate film program. Um, so yeah, that's an example, a uh, like, tangible example of how that definitely shaped this film. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. So Kai with Douglas, thank you so much, Ife. Um, with Douglas. So, well, first, can you, can you tell everyone what the result of this, this yeah. effort was? So as of November 18, 2020, the park is now Anna and Frederick Douglass. So essentially, uh, Bianca Jones was the educator who's featured in the film. She started this campaign in the 2016 to 2017 school year. Um, the young folks presented to the Chicago Park District in 2017, multiple times in 2019, um, in 2020, actually, even before the pandemic uh, began. And it was just silence, like the bureaucracy of how the city works is that if someone puts forward a proposal that the park district is supposed to respond within 45 days, um, that never happened. And then of course there was the racial, racial reckoning that happened this summer and the protest that happened at the Columbus statue um, downtown and out of nowhere, the Chicago park district decided to hold an emergency board meeting. And the only agenda item after ignoring them for three years was a renaming of Douglas park, uh, which was really monumentous for them and for them as young people like to persevere that like they were still doing this work, they were being ignored and they're just like, nope, we're still gonna keep this as part of our curriculum. We're still gonna present. We're gonna get community support in North Lawndale. Like their change.org petition had like over 4,000 signatures. Um, they are real organizers. Like, you know, they have their talking points. They're like, you know, media trained at this point, the amount of times they were interviewed by like the Tribune and Block Club Chicago and other outlets here in the city. Um, but for me, I was really drawn to tell this story because like my mother is an educator um, and just the importance I feel that there needs to be like culturally competent education that like affirms our black youth and how that can really dictate how you move through the world because you know, as a young person, the majority of your time is spent at school, right? Like this is the person who's shaping who you are. And I think even in this pandemic moment, parents and like the larger world is realizing like how much time like students spend in school and like how important it is, like the demographic of who educators are and you know, what they're instilling in young people is something that's just like really paramount um, and is something that I wanted to make a film about. 
Okay. So, so tell me, what do you think the role of film is in social justice? Yeah, I think my practice is very unique that, you know, documentary filmmaking is art and entertainment. And it also is like showing of facts and like a bridge of them in some ways. And I think my approach to documentary filmmaking specifically is, you know, documenting black youth and black elders and like people who live in public housing because I don't feel like there's a wide enough representation of those specific communities. I think documentaries can definitely be a tool for social change um, and should never be in the way of what, you know, activists are doing. Um, so if somebody I was documenting came to me and said, you know what, hey Kai, I feel uncomfortable and like not safe with my image being showcased, no problem. I would be like, okay, that's not a scene that's going to make it in. And like, there's a discussion that needs to be had. Um, I'm not sure if folks who are here are familiar with the film called Unapologetic that is on the film festival tour right now, which is made by my good friend Ashley O'Shea, which follows um, two young Black women who are in the organizing space in Chicago. Um, and Ashley just talked a lot about like the need to, you know, clear your images with the the folks that you're documenting because they are doing a lot of important work like there is a time and point where the school was getting phone calls because of the activism that the young folks were doing so it's like okay I'm never going to include a young person's last name because I don't want them to get doxxed like these are real issues that happen when you are following people who are saying things that are emphatic um, and who are saying things that are important that a lot of people sometimes don't want to hear. All right, fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Um, Brandon, okay. Oh, there you are. Look, I'm like, where's Brandon's box? <laughs> um, so first, I want to talk about your visual style. Because your film, there's a, we talked about this a little bit earlier, we talked about the texture. It's very, it's a very textured, it's very beautiful textured film. Um, and it has a distinctive, a very strong visual style. And so I'm curious, and again, it's another, it's another thing that we talk to our students about often, right, with respect to developing their style. And so can you talk to me about how you think it is or that, that process? Like, what are some of the things that have influenced you along the way, whether it be people or artistic movements or architecture or whatever, what are your influences? What has influenced your particular filmmaker style? Ooh, um, so I would say for me, what influenced my particular style of filmmaking is, is like a culmination of things. Um, from working with other directors, other cinematographers, um, looking at other forms of art, be it paintings, drawings, um, just, just uh, taking in so much art and just seeing what I like about that. So what is here? What are they doing here that I like? What are they doing here that that I like? And just trying to figure out how I can like mix mix that in or incorporate that, or just replicate that. And and through that process, I'm able to develop my own unique point of view, my own unique style or aesthetic. Essentially, I think that represents how I see the world, um, and want other people to see the world through that that lens. Essentially. All right. So in the film, um, he talks a lot about empathy, right? And so, so he's talking a lot about empathy, but my eye is seeing that there's a great deal of empathy in the way that you made the film, right? Because he is constantly sort of wrapped in light and wrapped in color, right? In this mm -hmm. very loving way. Like the, the way that you use and bend and shape light is quite loving, right? So was that intentional or was it serendipitous? And if it was serendipitous, that's okay too, because sometimes our work expands beyond what we thought we were capable of. But were you thinking about that as you were shooting him? So initially um, in like the Y shots where he's like doing an interview, that was uh, planned, but what he was saying was totally serendipitous. We, it was just, it was a happy accident was what we like to call it. It's like, oh, this works perfectly with what we're shooting and everything. Because um, when we went into, we had an idea of how we wanted to look cinematically, which is we wanted to have this feel, this texture, this style. And um, through the prelims, um, interviews and talking to him, we said, okay, it's going to be in that ballpark with the conversation we're going to have with him. 
And but when we were right there on set, it was like, it was supposed to be a like 60 minute interview. I'm um, 60 minute interview and it turned into like a two hour interview. And he was just giving us so much, just like opening himself up in a way we weren't, we weren't um, expecting or, ex or expecting of him. Um, particularly because he's, since he took that photo and ex it exploded everywhere, um, he's been in the public eye and in a, in a very brand new way that's not, that most people will feel more so guarded. I'm gonna do this documentary, I'm gonna do this interview because I like, I like, I like you guys. I like the idea of it. I like, you know, I wanna put myself out there. I do wanna provide context to that photo because um, there's, it's, it's a lot of, um, I guess, misinformation about it. So I do wanna give my own point of view in regards to it. And he just went on and told us a, a whole bunch more about how the photo came together, about who, who he is, about what his, who his, his, his audience is. And we're just like, oh my goodness. Um, and, and it just led us all spiral. So it went from being like a one day shoot turning into a three day shoot where we was like, can we get more of you? Can we get this? Can we get that? Can we get this and that? He was like, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was like a beautiful, it was a beautiful experience where it ended where we showed him the film and he's like, cool. He was like, is that a good cool or a bad cool? He was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like show it. I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send it to my parents. So he sent it to his mom and his grandma <laughs> and they loved it. And, it's, and they started crying from it. And it's just like, okay, we did this guy justice. Um, and we're like super happy. And yeah, it was, it was a, it was a beautiful experience. Um, just in, like knowing that we were able to get that type of emotion out of the people that are closest to him and know him well. Uh, and and we said, all right, this is good to put out into the world, um, knowing that. It was definitely working on this project was like a social obligation with um, to him and to the world as a whole um, with the amount of information that he gave us. Uh, and we just, you know, like, it was just so much that was like left on the cutting room floor because we was like, we want to put that in. That's That hits on the point in terms of Black people, but maybe alienating to other people. Mm -hmm. So it was like we want this to be emp empathetic. We want other people to see this and have like a, an action, like, "Hey, I need to do better to my black brothers and sisters within the world. Um, stand up for them. Be, be, be an ally, essentially, um, versus making them feel uncomfortable and want to like go the other way." Um, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, congratulations, right? Um, and I think that it is the beauty of your film, the empathy of your film, but also the hopeful note, right? The hope that that runs within it um, is very much what drew us to your film. It's very much what drew me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways it set the tone for kind of how we we viewed everything because we decided, you know, I, we would love it if we could curate films that are hopeful, right? That are authentic in their discussion of the Black experience, that are timely in their discussion of what's going on in the world, but there is this note of hope in all of them, um, which was so beautiful and so inspiring. I know that my time is up. I'll turn it back over to Joelle uh, for everyone else. I know that you all probably have individual questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camille. Those are really great questions. I'm glad I was, I was like, yeah, that's the question I wanted answered. Um, I wanted to go ahead and give people in the room an opportunity to send um, a question to any of the filmmakers. I know Camille has more, uh, has more questions, but we wanted to give folks an opportunity in the room here to ask a few questions of the filmmakers and they can be sent to me in the chat because I think the chat is set up where it only comes to me anyways. And filmmakers, you can certainly ask questions of one another, right? So like if you Yeah. Like if you if you're curious about somebody else's process, hey, you know, drop mm -hmm. it in the chat. So far I don't see any questions in the chat. So Camille, you feel free to ask any more if you'd like. So one of the things, and this is open to, to all of you, or you know, one, two, all three, um, but I think that Ify, you kind of touched on it a tiny bit at the beginning, where you were saying that, you know, when you're making a documentary, documentaries 
they kind of, they have their own lives. They have, they want to do whatever they want to do, right? So can the three of you kind of talk to us about your experience with documentary production and that, that particular dynamic of working on a documentary and having, you know, they're kind of like a thing that you kind of have to constantly rein in, right? So how, like, talk to me about the, the documentary dynamic. Yeah, I could talk a little bit about this. I think documentary, right? It's real life events for the most part, unless your your format or your visual style is like a sit down interview. But even then it's like the coordination and like the logistics that go into a documentary. I think for me, um, sometimes it's like a thematic idea that I'll have in my head and then trying to find a participant that, you know, their life story or whatever is going on, like meets that thematic element. Um, and just like trying to spend time with the participant before I even put a camera in front of their face, especially if it's gonna be a project that is like longitudinal, which means, you know, filming with them more than once or twice because it's like relationship building, the, the relationship that a director filmmaker has with their participant in the documentary space is one that's really important because it has to be built upon trust, right? Um, someone's letting you into their lives in a very intimate way, if that's like the style of storytelling that you do. Um, but someone once told me, and I really think this is true, is like, there's the film you think you're gonna make, right? When you're in pre-production, there's the film you shoot and then there's like the actual film you edit. And those are like three wildly different things. And just trying to like keep your artistic integrity at each of those stages is really important. Um, and I think over the years, I've just learned just flexibility in the process because I think there have been films that I've made where it's like, oh, this is the ultimate gold money scene that I want and it's like, you miss the day. And it's like, how do you shift the format and the structure of the film to not let that eat you up inside? Or, you know, um, has been something that I've really learned. But with documentaries, just like flexibility, good communication with your participants um, has, has been really key in my filmmaking process. Camille, I have some questions that are pouring in now. Okay, and so, well, the first one is, um, First, I'll just read more of an, um, an observation that says, great films, no question uh, for the filmmakers, though I thought it was painful that one of the mothers in holding space referring to her daughter as aggressive. I don't know if Ife wanted to mention anything about that. Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, I think based on the society that we live in and our experiences, there's a lot that we have internalized as Black people. And I think, you know, we're all dealing with our traumas and what we've internalized and processing that. So I think there are definitely things that, you know, we've been taught to like not love about ourselves. And unfortunately, some of that we've, you know, um, consciously or unconsciously held on to. So I think that's something she is processing as a human as a, and as a mother. And I think, and I actually am glad she was able to voice that to somebody, to the doula, Maisha, who was able to speak truth to that and speak love to that. And like essentially say, no, she's a baby. She's, this is just who she is. And honestly, as a filmmaker, I think something else that was crucial, and I love what, you know, Kai, you were talking about relationship building and trust, and that was just something I just had to embody being in that room. Like, she says, this is her perception of her daughter, and I can't, I just had to be present for that, and like, we see that I, in the room, couldn't stop filming, or even afterwards, like, you know, caution her against saying that. I just had to be present and in the room. And honestly, as a documentary filmmaker, this person, unless the person is, you know, potentially maybe cause harm to themselves or bring harm to themselves in that moment, being as still and present as possible to just receive what's happening in the room. And honestly, also being as still <laughs> as possible because I don't want to disrupt, because I'll, honestly, it's a privilege to be in that space and it's an honor, it's a sacred space to somebody's home and still alive. And it's different. So I have perceptions about myself that I'm, you know, I'm working with and we're each working through our stuff. And so it was just being as still and taking up as little space as possible, just so that what is happening in front of me can happen organically. Um, so while yes, it's it's unfortunate that she thinks that, but I think 
based on what I saw in her relationship with the doula that she has people in her life that can speak to her and she's in therapy. So, so um, hopefully she's gonna work through that. Um, and I think we're all imperfect people and we're all, we all have stuff that we're working through. So. Right, thank you for that. I have a question for Kai. So Kai, uh, this person here, uh, Bernard, um, has a question. It's like, do you have a philosophy of education that you could elaborate on? I'm thinking more about how well people read. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I think it's really interesting. So like, I am not a Chicago native. Like I didn't go through Chicago public schools. Like even growing up in Miami, I was in the public school system from K through fifth grade. And then I, you know, went through, um, private school system for like middle school and high school and like went to a PWI. Um, but I think my model of education is something that's definitely like holistic and like teaching people like actionable skills and like developing them as individuals. Like I was definitely one of those people um, when they were a senior in high school, I was telling my family that like, I wasn't interested in like college as like a continuing education thing. And it was kind of like something that was forced on me, like you need to do this. Um, and so I like relented in the process because I think like, it's a shame how expensive like it costs for folks to continue their education and like I um, often think about like what would society look like if we were truly in like an apprentice model like I think I knew from an early age that like storytelling was something that I was really interested in like growing up as a kid my mom was like okay you have to read the newspaper every day and like pick one story and like tell me the story while I drive you to school. Um, so I was always just like a curious child because like that is something that my mom ingrained in me. Um, so I think education doesn't just live in the classrooms, right? And like Douglas is an example of that. Like they did actionable grassroots campaign as part of their school curriculum. And it's like, yes, people need to be able to do math. People need to be able to read. People need to be able to write but analysis of the world that we're living in is something that's also important and like it is a real disservice when school systems don't you know groom young folks to be able to analyze what's happening in the world and just to kind of you know be be a rock in the sea and kind of just like move with the water and I think at VLA that's not something that happens like that school affirms those young folks and tells them that like no you can question someone if you disagree with them and like these are the ways that you can do it these are the ways that you can like show up for yourself and also advocate for yourself um, so that's the type of education model that I feel like um, I enjoy and I think also probably part of it um, for kindergarten, I went to like a Montessori school and that's like kind of like self-led education systems um, for young people, I think is something that's really important. Thank you, Kai. Um, Mark Delancey actually had a question um, and that question is for um, a question from somebody who has very little clue about what goes into filmmaking. He, you know, he says, I'm struck by how tender and intimate especially the first and third films are, how does one get that in a film? Is it just the result of spending an enormous amount of time with the subjects? Is there more to it than that? And this is for any any of the filmmakers present. Um, I would say for, in, in my case for Legacy, uh, for us, it was, it was a result of us spending time with the subject before we even began rolling. Um, in our initial approach, we, we approached him in about May and we had two months worth of conversations before actually shooting because of his schedule. So he was like really familiar with us and understood where we were trying to do and go with it. Um, but initially, here's a fun fact, initially we wanted to shoot it in his house and he told us, all right, no, it's COVID, I don't know, you guys, it's crazy. Um, but like after we did that first sit down interview, and he says, wow, he says, you know what, it'll be cool we get this and this type of shot. He says, oh, you wanna come to the house and do it? And then she was like, he said, yeah, you guys are cool. Like, I, I feel totally comfortable around you. Like, after having like a person to person interaction with you, like, I know you guys are good, everything is cool. I just gotta clear it with the missus. <laughs> and so then we was able to spend those more intimate days with him, um, a day in the life, following him on the shoot, um, seeing his workspace where he thinks, um, sitting down with like, roles, the roles of um, um, 
um, negatives that he has stored away. He says, oh, you want to see this from this shoot? I can't show it. The shoot is not out yet, but I can show you the, the, the roles. So just like having this like um, intimate dialogue with him, like where his friends or his buddies essentially um, came through having emails, um, DM conversations, phone conversations, just checking in on each other, seeing um, how the family is, how he's doing. And um, just, you know, just continuous building that just dropped the walls and just made it like he wasn't, the cameras weren't present. He was just talking to two, two guys and then, and that was it. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. um, I jump in and say something. Sure. Um, I think to what Brandon said, which is so true about spending time with your subject beforehand, but also, sorry, who asked the question? What's the name of the person? Um, uh, Mark Delancey. Oh, Mark Delancey, yeah. Um, I think also, Mark, something that I personally strongly believe in is like your, I, I, I think how you feel about whoever the subject, you know, person in front of your camera affects how you frame them. Um, and I just personally, I love black women. I really do. I mean, I, I, you know, I spent some time with the doula, but the mothers, I hadn't spent any time with them. I wish I, wish I had. Um, that would have been a, I think that would have been a privilege and it was something I didn't have access to. I only had access to do at first. So we spoke on the phone. She was, she was suspect about just us feeling me out. I was feeling her out. We like trying to get a sense of each other's vibe. And I got to have a one-on-one -on -one with her, but the mothers I hadn't spoken to at all. And so I think how, and it's something that comes through consciously and unconsciously, like how you frame them. And even what Camille was saying about like Brandon, like the light, like how he shaped it and how he was even lit, like kind of like backlit, like all of that. I think it's um, it's a translation of like how you perceive that person. And so I think if you love the person you're, the person in the situation that you're photographing, if you're passionate about it, I think how you frame them, how you like them, like, do you, are you looking up at them? Are you looking down at them? Are you at their height? Like all those things, like whether you choose to do it consciously or unconsciously, like it really comes through. So I think, yeah, that was just something I wanted to bring up. Like in addition to spending time with the subject, like how you feel about that person like comes through and how you frame them. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to follow that up um, Ife with, Another question that was asked is if you could talk about the doulas and the emotional and health relationships they had with black women, like the, the layering of that relationship between the doula and the black women, sort of talk about more about the, the emotion and emotional and health relationships, how they navigate those two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So propose the question again. Uh, uh, can Ife talk more about doulas mm -hmm. in general and the emotion and health relationships they had mm -hmm. with black mm -hmm. women. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not an expert. Uh, I just knew that I wanted to follow a doula around. But when I spoke with the doula, my, her name is Maisha Campbell. She's based in New York. Um, she's from New York. And something she told me is that um, a common perception of doulas is like they're advocates for this mothers and her personal philosophy is not advocacy. It's more holding, it's actually holding space and like yielding and being a support system for this woman. And so I know she told me that she has multiple sessions with them, like um, prenatal sessions, but also she's there with them in the hospital when they're having um, having birth and then also giving them support afterwards. So she's very involved in their lives. And I think it's when some, I, I, again, I'm not a mother, I've never given birth, don't know what that process is like, um, but I can only imagine how intense that it is to share that with somebody. And as a result of going through such an intense experience with somebody, the other things start to come up. And if you're sharing that with somebody who's, who is um, patient and is receptive and it, it almost becomes like, um, it almost also becomes like therapy too. It's like, oh, this person like has a lot of information with regards to health, but she's also there for me in this like such an intense time. And so that also becomes an emotional um, relationship. I'm not too sure how she juggles it and how she balances it. I just know that her personal philosophy is just like giving space to these women to, say whatever it is that they need and her being there to receive it. And 
I just personally feel that there's so much Black women are expected to do and to be strong and to present a certain way. And I'm just glad that there are people like Maisha who can hold space for Black women to just be vulnerable and to share whatever it is that they're going through. Thank you, Ife. I have one more question here for Kai. Um, and that is, how important is it to you that your work possess a level of optimism when dealing with a heavy subject such as Douglas? And then after that, I'll have a question uh, for everyone uh, to sort of... Um, yeah, um, I don't know if I like approached it with like having a sense of optimism, like right, the confines of the film is like, you know, this practice and rehearsal that they have in the classroom. And then you follow them off on the train, and they kind of like go into the distance. You, you, I've thought about it a lot recently um, since they have like now been successful and I did start filming them again um, in the summer of 2020 and, you know, am working on a follow up to the film, but I think it definitely has like a sense of levity since it is kids discussing like a very, you know, serious issue and like has a juvenile component, um, which is just like another dynamic of the film. Um, but I don't think every film has to show optimism. Um, another film that I recently completed is about someone who was like trying to figure out a new housing situation and like ultimately she didn't um, and like, life isn't always optimistic, I guess, is the, the the response that I have. And like, if you're authentically telling someone's story and they end up in a situation where there is no way that they should be optimistic about the situation, I think like the film has to be able to reflect that um, and can be difficult for some people at times. Like, I think I was talking with someone the other day, like I'm interested in making films about people that I would wanna hang out with, like personally and be in my life. Like, I think with documentary, like, it's really difficult to spend an extended amount of time with someone you don't like. Like that's just the the ins and outs of it. Um, and so, yeah, I appreciate that question. I think the tone of the film should always be the tone of the lived experience of the person. Right. And one of the que another question I think everyone wants to know is what do you what do you all plan to work on next? Because now that we've got our eyes on you, kind of like you know are we we're going to be like so what else are they making? So what do you have in the pipeline, pre-production, post-production? Um, what are your plans for the future moving on from uh, this film that we've seen here? A feature, a, a longer version of the same film? What are, what's happening? And anyone can jump in. Brandon? Okay. <laughs> I was like, all right, who wants to, who wants to go first? So, okay. I was, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let them go. I'm going to just go last. But all right, I'll go first. Um, so um, next project that I have that I'm currently working on is um, another documentary um, short. Uh, it's about a D1 basketball player who has a career injury. And he finds himself, he rediscovers himself in, in yoga. And through his um, yoga practice, he's able to take it see the world in a, in a way he never thought it was possible. And next he wants to share that joy of yoga with um, our older demographic. So people who are 50, 60, 70, um, he shows them yoga as an alternative um, way of life or alternative medicine. Um, instead of taking pills, you can use it for arthritis um, and the injury preventions around it. So currently working on that, um, we did, the filming is locked. Um, it's just, isn't like on a post limbo because there's a couple of shots that I want to get, but because of COVID, I can't get them right now. So waiting until hopefully the summer where things are more relaxed, um, social gatherings are more allowed um, in order to get those shots and next that's out the door for the world to see. Uh, on top of that, I'm working on a, another short narrative piece. Uh, it's a comedy, it's about a guy, a guy, um, a guy, a guy, a guy and a girl have an argument. Um, the girl loses the argument, so she invents time travel to go back and win the argument. Um, I'm working on that a little comedy <laughs> sci-fi, and um, I have another sci-fi um, short that I'm trying to get funding for, which hopefully will happen either this year or next year. Got it. You are busy. Yep. I'm trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Ify, what do you have in the pipelines, or what do you? What um. do you 
You know, I wish I could say nothing and just normalize like not working on anything. Because <laughs> um, I, I do think also creation happens in rest as well. I, um, but I just finished a production on a short film, a narrative. I'm also a narrative filmmaker. Um, and as much as I love documentaries and being present from them, I also love imagining things and um, just uh, dreaming of things. And so I just wrapped production on a narrative short and it was just a very intense process of shooting during this time um, and working with um, two, um, two kids, non-professional actors and their mother. And so just a story about a, um, a young boy and his um, younger brother who come home after school to find their mother making pancakes for dinner, which is really extraordinary in their house. And so he goes around searching for the reason like why she's doing that and he finds out she's going to be leaving um, for a month and so it's just something he finds out on his own that he has to keep his um, protect his younger brother from that knowledge and so I just finished production on that and I'm in pre-production for another narrative short and so those are just some things I'm working on in addition to being a student yeah wow that's wonderful um um, how about you, Kai? Um, I have another film that's on the festival circuit right now called Queenie, um, and it'll be playing at the Cleveland International Film Festival in April. I think they're releasing the lineup next week, but since you all are here, Congratulations family, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really excited about that. Um, and hopefully as every filmmaker, you hope that like your project ends up finding like permanent digital distribution somewhere is like a goal that I have for that project. Um, and then I'm in the process of editing a new iteration of Douglas since the campaign has now been successful. So um, that will come out sometime this summer. Okay, great. Um, I wanna, unless anyone else um, in here has any more questions. Um, I'm sorry, one last question. And this is for Brandon. Does documenting such events like the film Legacy trigger you? If so, do you reboot and keep moving forward? Uh, yeah, uh, so the film itself doesn't trigger me, but the process of making it does. Um, hearing what Mark had to talk about um, as a Black creative and just being on the front lines throughout the, um, the whole Black Lives Matter protest of 2020, uh, it, was, it was a little disheartening at times, it was heavy. Um, hearing what he had to say about it, um, his experience, through his experiences, how people have interacted with him. Um, like, you would think because he, he's showing love and um, hope and um, empathy in his work that it will resonate with other people. But there's also been, there's an ugly side to it. There's a lot of resistance that he gets to threats and things like that, which we decided not to include. So like hearing him tell those tales is, was like super draining and the thoughts that he had um, around it and everything like that, um, it it it's, it's, it's it becomes heavy in that sense. But um, when the final piece is out in the world and you're happy with something that you created, and other people are able to share and enjoy, it's um, it helps. It just washes all that away, and you just live in that moment of uh, of that creation. Wonderful. So can I just tell you, I'm so happy that all three of you came here and, um, and that I, I really enjoy your films. And I'm actually going to recommend that folks that are here after this ends go back and watch the films again, just because I think after having this discussions, you may also view them with an extra layer of um, you know, appreciation um, after having heard the conversation we've just had. So I know that they'll probably change their passwords uh, or change passwords to the films um, soon, but I recommend uh, folks to watch them again. And I wanna thank all three filmmakers here for coming here this evening and sharing this virtual space with us. Um, and we look forward to hear about all the great things you'll be doing moving forward. Um, I wanted to also point out that tomorrow we're having the exper experimental shorts program with two experimental films, um, Raisin and Bajuli. I never look at the sun by Bajuli. So if you really like tonight's event, please stay tuned for all the other film screenings that's coming up uh, this week. 
uh, on Friday, we're gonna have the cinematography shorts program. And I know that one of the filmmakers brought up uh, something about distribution and trying to get content like this out in the world and seen by many people. And so we'll have a panel discussion on black film distribution. So uh, stay tuned um, and we're gonna go ahead and drop the survey link uh, so you can tell us if you're doing a good or terrible job so we can make it better. And we'll also drop the Eventbrite link so you can register for the experimental film program that's gonna to happen tomorrow at the same time at 5.30. I'm gonna sort of request that my director, Dr. Julie Moody Freeman come back in the room so she can have the last word. And I also would like to thank Camille DeBose. Camille, thank you so much for those amazing questions and for moderating this conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. Um, and Julie, did you want to say anything? Yes, I, I really want to thank Brandon, Ife, and Kai. I mean, you really honored us with those films. Um, and as Camille told you all at the beginning, you all made it absolutely tough for the jurists. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, it was, it was fun, it was fun. Uh, thank you so much. And then again, thanks to the audience. Take care, everybody. And thank you all for coming. And we'll hopefully see you soon in another screening and another event. And uh, good luck to the filmmakers. I will be in touch with you all three, OK? And have a good night.